Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. The comedians and the comics were, were merciless, weren't they, at the time? You were the butt of some very unkind jokes. Oh, some of them got quite rich. Elizabeth Taylor was seen in town today wearing a yellow dress, and a group of children at the uh, bus stop ran toward her and boarded her. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing bravely. It must have, must have hurt at the time. Well, it did. I, it did then. I laughed the loudest, but... It hurt inside. In the 1980s, women and girls had no need for Instagram to tear apart our self-esteem. We had late night comedians. And without TikTok, the only outlets for a celebrity influencer to make statements about their lives in their own words were the very press that helped fuel the comedian's material. The landscape was meant to be intimidating. After all, it had evolved out of L.B. Mayer's design. But Elizabeth Taylor was not put on this earth to keep her mouth shut. No true influencer is. To reach the greatest audience with her story, Elizabeth could turn to tabloids, magazines, or do prestigious interviews with the best at the time. She chose the latter. Elizabeth's testimony of her recovery journey broke ground, ending the silence and spin around those in public life who suffered from addiction. Her act of going public destigmatized the disease, and it was her intent to do so in order to help others. The way that she was so open about big things that were happening, you know, like when she went to Betty Ford, she knew it wasn't going to stay a secret. So she got ahead of it and, and let out a press release. That allowed people to get sober, like celebrities and be okay with it. It removed a lot of the stigma that was placed on, you know, the failure, which it isn't a failure. It's just something that happens. And, you know, you need to get help for it. And it's okay to ask for help. I mean, Elizabeth's telling people, it's okay to ask for help. We were all there on the same level. We were all there with the same problem. Uh, none of us were better off. None of us were worse off. Uh, none of us were better human beings or worse human beings. Using her voice and platforms to destigmatize addiction was a very conscious act. She knew she would be heard and seen if she delivered an honest message, if she shared her truth. She knew her honesty would help alleviate suffering. Well, I feel so strongly about it, uh, about receiving help. And I know there's so many people out there that need help the way I did for uh, medications, for alcoholism, that are scared to seek help. I was terrified. And I'm so grateful now that I did ask for help, that I allowed myself to be helped, and I'm continuing to seek help. What was unseen, unknowable to the conscious mind, is not where her testimony, her voice, would lead others, but where it would lead Elizabeth herself. She had survived a miscarriage, abuse, a system that treated her as property, the death of a husband and friends, near financial collapse, a relentless press, and was still considered an accomplished actress, front page news, and the most beautiful woman alive. Why? What was it all for? I can't tell you or show you whether or not Elizabeth was contemplating that question as she walked out of the Betty Ford Clinic and into the next phase of her life. But I can say, in the case of Elizabeth Taylor, sometimes the answer for why comes up underneath you in ways no one could have ever foreseen. And if you respond to it, 
with the clarity and strength that Elizabeth did, well, that's the why behind telling this story, her story, so that you can know it really is possible for just one person, one voice to make a difference in the world, to change us all for the better, whether we realize it or not. Never question the power of your voice, but do examine how it came to be, why you have it, and how you can best use it. Those questions can all be answered with an honest mirror. In this episode, we'll have some fun with those questions, wrapping our arms around what it was really like to be Elizabeth Taylor. We'll examine what kind of life she had built for herself at this point in her journey, the point just before her life's calling would unexpectedly land on her doorstep. And then you can ask yourself, would that calling have ever presented itself if she hadn't first built the life? The day-to-day work, the life of being Elizabeth Taylor was no joke, no matter how many comedians thought they knew her well enough to pick it apart. By the mid-1980s, Elizabeth's life, her celebrity and the material things like diamonds, that had value for her solely for the way that they had come into her life. It was all going to matter in a way no one could have ever predicted. It all played a part in her next act. It was a life found in a mirror that would fuel a voice, a roar for change. I'm Katy Perry, and this is Elizabeth I. It's super hard to shop for the Elizabeth Taylor in your life. You know, someone with such spectacular taste and impeccable style that nothing seems good enough. I think that's how Lisa feels when she tries to buy something for me. Just kidding, mom. Maybe they're the hostess with the hottest invite in town, or maybe they're the most stylish person you know. When you're not sure what holiday gift to get them, head to Rakuten. You'll find something for everyone on your list and you'll get cash back. Rakuten helps you get the most savings plus cash back at thousands of stores like Bloomingdale's, Apple, Sephora, and Target. With the cash back you earn, you'll have everyone on your list saying, wow, I cannot believe you got me this. So get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. I felt so redundant and useless. So I thought, what can I do to make myself this is feel like five. for some reason I'm Home on the face of is this is where the earth. heart is. So I thought, what is the most challenging thing I can think of doing? And I thought, I thought, Broadway. I've never done Broadway, and I was drinking so much. I thought, you can't be a lush and do Broadway. So I decided to do Broadway. And I did uh, Lillian Hellman's The Little Foxes. And it snapped me together. For the artist, making great art is always the place to start. Elizabeth turning inward to draw on her well of talent was the first monumental step towards real healing. The next step, to seek the medical care she needed, would come from a family intervention. But the talent, it would be there for her. Heading to Broadway to do Little Foxes was the deep dive that Elizabeth needed to be sure it would. Then came discipline. Following the program that she learned at Betty Ford, Elizabeth made sure the relationships that mattered most were mended and tended. She would soon need them, and they her in ways no one could fathom. On the business front, well, the Elizabeth Taylor brand would skyrocket in the 80s. And as she was a celebrity, the brand was her. Her life, her taste, her art, her loves, and soon a human being's most primal expression of self, her scent. So what did it look like, the life of being Elizabeth? What was the operation? After everything that had happened to her and that she did to herself, 
what did it look like when she snapped herself together? Two of Elizabeth's trustees, Tim Mendelson and Barbara Berkowitz, were at her side during these years. They'll guide us through this episode, letting us see inside the operation of the first celebrity influencer. More than anything, it was an authentic one that many of today's social media influencers either aspire to or try to falsely represent. And here's the big takeaway that will help you separate the real diamonds from the cubic zirconias. When you're living a life as large and complicated as Elizabeth Taylor, frivolity stops at the door. She was smart. She could read you like a book. Um, And it was just fascinating to see what she picked up from people and had had a low threshold of bullshit. She did not like bullshit. She did not like to be pacified and talked down to. She wanted it straight. Um, but yeah, she had, she had no tolerance for bullshit. I mean, it was a really hard job. People said to me all the time, like, I don't know how you do this. This has got to be the hardest job in the world. And you couldn't pay me a million dollars to do this job. I don't want to make it seem like it was all fun and games. I mean, it was a tough, tough job. Oh, boy. Um, I started working for Elizabeth in 1989. And so how many years is that? A long time. I was a child when I started. (laughs) A child. So I grew up in Beverly Hills. I have... People are, were in and out of our house my whole life, celebrities. Celebrities were of no factor. With Elizabeth, she was the only one for the entire time that I worked for her. I would lose my breath and have to compose myself before I actually saw her. So if we were meeting upstairs in her bedroom, I may not be a marathon runner, but I can make it a flight of steps without huffing and puffing. I would lose my breath and have to stand outside for a minute so that I wasn't hyperventilating because I knew I was going to see her. And it's not like she would uh, be demanding. She never raised her voice, things like that. But it gave me the jitters, and it never stopped. And I worked for her for decades. And every time I saw her, I had butterflies in my stomach. There was one case that Barbara worked on for Elizabeth, which uniquely touched on their future relationship. It was the time Elizabeth challenged Barbara to learn real estate law, solving a conflict involving the heart of Elizabeth's operation, her home. I would get calls from Elizabeth to right the wrongs when other lawyers weren't doing things right, when they weren't protecting her. Uh, I remember waking up from a nap on a Saturday to a phone call from what I still say it was Maggie the cat. Barbara? It's like, oh crap. It's a Saturday. What did I do? And she had lost. The senior partner had given another associate one of her cases and they had lost. So she called me and said, you heard what happened? And I'm like, yep. She says, well, do you do, and I'm like, real estate law? I'm like, no, not really. And there was silence. And when there's silence, you better figure out something. I said, but do you want me to learn? And she went, yep. So I had two weeks to turn around the loss of a case. And it was over land. I mean, I, this is just stuff that I don't do. Um, and I learned in two weeks how to turn the whole thing around, bring it up on appeal, win it on appeal. And I mean, I was studying a lot. It was all on easements. She, and I, I, I would do those types of things for her. I would try and correct things that had happened that just didn't go her way. Because it was very hard to say to Elizabeth, you lost, and then walk away. And she was right. Because the paperwork that the other associate and the senior partner had done were crap. And so I can understand why they lost. So I had to go to her and say, okay, I can try and turn this around, but I'm going to get sanctioned because I'm going to be doing something that 
I have no new facts to bring to the table and I'm going to turn it around on appeal for you, but you are going to get sanctioned for about 2,500 bucks. She didn't care. She wanted her land. You always wanted to make her happy. I mean, and she was right. I mean, our firm was wrong. So I just thought it was sloppy, which was very typical for the, uh, for the senior partner. And that's why she always wanted me to kind of come in and, and um, eyeball things to make sure that she wasn't getting screwed. So then what happened? I won. And I was given um, just various things to do for her, including First Amendment work, since I had um, really focused on First Amendment because of, I was trained by Justice Kennedy. And so that was my interest in constitutional law. And so that's where I started, and Elizabeth had certain things for me to do, and then she was suing tabloids. So that's where I came in and sued the tabloids on Elizabeth's behalf. So I felt like, okay, you're after me, here I am. Uh, it was a bit of, sort of, a bit of Mike Todd, too. I jutted my jaw and stood my ground. No revenge, but she hated being um, portrayed in the way that the tabloids portrayed her, that she was drinking. The first case, I believe she was drinking, they said, in her hospital room, and she had champagne bottles underneath the bedside. Um, so they were just downright lying about her. That she couldn't handle. She didn't care if people name-called her a little bit, but she just didn't like the uh, complete lies. You can't hide from yourself, so why hide from the world? And it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating cases that I did for her. I did more than one. Um, one of the things that was special about litigating for Elizabeth was somebody started calling me from the tabloids anonymously and giving me the inside scoop of what was happening inside the tabloid. Um, so that if I was suing the right people, if I was asking the right questions in discovery, which freaked out my senior partner. He's like going, who is this person? I said, I have no idea, but they keep calling me. And Elizabeth loved it. She just thought it was fabulous that we were getting some inside information. Um, the guy did eventually, years later, tell me who he was. I don't allow those rags in the house. Uh, I certainly don't believe them because I, if I'm told about something, I know the truth. And that's all that matters. If my family and my friends know the truth, that's all that matters to me. She just didn't want to be lied about. She wasn't... She wasn't um this reckless person who was in a hospital bed drinking. I mean, that just, you know, that just isn't a good look. And she just thought the tabloids had, had really taken advantage. And so she wanted to sue. And we did. And we were, um, we settled in her favor. Can't tell you the amount, but um, anything you've read about Elizabeth is true. She likes more zeros than the average person. <laughs> So let's just say she was happy. I mean, you have to show um, malice um, because she was a public figure, but we didn't go to trial. So um, it was all settled before we had to do anything like that. But it's not like the Carol Burnett case um, where she sued the tabloids. She broke ground because it's still good law that the tabloids are not considered newspapers, so they have, you know, an extra... Um, they have to be a little more cautious than a newspaper, uh, which I actually spoke to Carol Burnett about one day, telling her her law was still good, and she loved it. We were having our nails done. <laughs> Tim Mendelson, Elizabeth's right hand for over two decades, took a more unique path to becoming indispensable to Elizabeth's operation. Like Elizabeth's childhood friend, Jill Sherry Robinson, their relationship began thanks to the wardrobe department. Well, I was friends with Melissa Rivers. Her name was Rosenberg then, but Joan Rivers and 
Edward Rosenberg were her parents, and we went to high school together. And one day I went over to Melissa's house. I, had, I was in college at this point, uh, but I went over to go swimming, and Joan and Edgar pulled me aside. She did a very wonderful thing for me, and she said, what are you going to do with your life, and, and what do you want to do for the summer? And she helped me get a job with Nolan Miller. My job was basically to shop for the fabrics. My title was shopper, something that I'm pretty good at. And, uh, and so, you know, Donna Peterson, who happened to have worked for Helen Rose, who was the MGM costume designer and like a second mother to Elizabeth, uh, Donna did the sketches and, and, uh, and it was just a really amazing experience. Elizabeth uh, had moved back to LA, had gone to rehab, had lost a lot of, it, she came back from Washington after her marriage to Senator Warner. And she'd done Little Foxes, she did Little Foxes, and I think she may have done Private Lives already with Richard Burton. And she bought a house in Bel Air, just like a really big but comfortable ranch style house. Nolan had always wanted to design clothes for her. I mean, she was his dream movie star, and he'd done everybody. I mean, he did Joan Crawford and Lana Turner and Anne Margaret, and uh, obviously Joan Collins and Linda Evans and, you know, all of that. But he wanted to do Elizabeth Taylor. Typical. Most people did. And so he got to make a full wardrobe for her. I mean, I think there were probably 10 costumes. Everything from negligee, to, you know, fur wraps and all this stuff with fur on it and, and suits. And it was just a big thing. The clothes, the wardrobe, the stuff. There's so much that has been written and told about Elizabeth's jewelry. This part of her lifestyle is so often overlooked. And it was, without any hyperbole, massive. Look, one can't be declared the most beautiful woman in the world have that be an integral part of the brand and not have the beauty and fashion aspect of her identity be an operation in and of itself. Not if you're a business mogul like Elizabeth Taylor. To make this part of managing Elizabeth's life even more complicated, well, as Barbara once said, Elizabeth doesn't stay anywhere very long. No grass grew, grew under her feet. Elizabeth Taylor was an enterprise body on the move. So I, was, I went back to work in film. I was working in post-production. Incredibly boring. I really had very little to do. And Shen and Georgette called me to say, Elizabeth's launching a new fragrance called White Diamonds. Elizabeth will be on a private plane. And we need somebody to be an advanced person. So all, you're gonna, all you need to do, all you need to do is travel with the luggage commercially. However, you will go first class. There will be people to meet you and take you to the hotel and from the hotel, drop you off. I mean, we'll have everything set up and all you really need to do is just be with it and make sure it didn't always happen flawlessly or, you know, however, it was, that was true. And, uh, and then when you get to the room, I travel with all the luggage. So it was like 40 suitcases. And we get back to the hotel, and then they're going to set it up with clothing racks, and that's where you're going to arrange all the clothes. Well, I spent my childhood arranging clothes. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I cleaned out my closet, and my sister's closet, and my parents' closet. And in college, I would clean, help people organize their closets. So all these fabulous clothes, tons of Valentino, and all I did was arrange, I arranged it like a store. And, you know, with the shoes and the handbags. And then she would arrive, and there it was. And Elizabeth had this Terry Mugler suit with silver hardware, royal blue, that she was wearing to the, this huge press conference. And she didn't have silver earrings. So she sent me to Tiffany to pick out silver earrings. So I brought a couple of pairs. She wore one of them. So that was my first time of shopping, really shopping for Elizabeth. And, you know, she was really nice to me. Elizabeth's wardrobe was not only an integral part of her business operation as a celebrity, it was part of a valuable collection. After decades working with the greatest costume artisans in the world, like Nolan Miller, 
and being the biggest star in her industry, Elizabeth had amassed a collection of -of one-of-a-kind pieces. Whether a piece was for a film, an event, or a photographed outing that would grace countless tabloids, Elizabeth's wardrobe was historic. That said, none of it would have mattered to Elizabeth if she didn't also genuinely enjoy wearing these works of art. She wore what she loved, and they became her memories, a catalog of her life, relationships, and adventures. Elizabeth's archivist gives us another frame to the picture. We also have another warehouse full of personal effects. And again, this is after the Christie sale in 2011, in which lots of her jewelry and clothing and other personal effects were sold. We still have a warehouse worth of this that we are slowly going through. You know, after getting in deep with the papers, we also started to kind of shift gears and get into the clothes and start to catalog what was left. And while a lot was sold at auction, uh, we're also finding a lot of gems in there, a lot of, of costumes, a lot of things that she wore, um, just really fabulous pieces of fashion history as well. We do have a piece from Cleopatra, perhaps one of the most famous pieces uh, in arguably film history is d- used during the scene of Cleopatra's entrance to Rome. That was designed by Irene Sheriff, who did all the costumes for Cleopatra. We have the, the gown that is sewn with thread dipped in gold and the, the, the beaded overlay. We also uncovered something that wasn't even labeled, but it was this cap that was made by, I believe it was Rex's in Beverly Hills. And through the intrepid research of our fashion archivist, Janice, she was able to find out that it was actually uh, used in Cleopatra in uh, one scene that we, we actually have an original costume sketch for that we don't have the dress, but we, we do have the headpiece uh, for this scene, which is it's this sort of gold leafed and uh, white floral garlanded headpiece um, that's really fantastic and that's just that's one example of these the kinds of gems that we're continually uncovering just the more we look every day before there were warehouses the main storage facility for elizabeth's life was of course her home elizabeth's home was where everything happened 700 Nimes road and in in bel-air like there was so much activity. There was such an intake of things, you know, stuff constantly arriving at the house. Gifts, flowers, shopping, clothes, everything is always coming in. And then it's like, how do we deal with moving things out? But it wasn't just things, it was people, you know, more and more people, you know, from her family. Her house was open. She had her private space upstairs, which was not open, but her doors were always open to a to those in need but to family to friends whoever wanted to come by it was almost like there was a part of it that was a public space and then a private space but this was all private i mean there was a gate there was security and and there was staff and and so many people and activities she did Barbara Walters interviews at the home and also Diane Sawyer and Maria Shriver and all of the interviews and documentary um, interviews as well, one-on-one and then, you know, for different projects, for fragrance projects, uh, uh, photo shoots. A lot of the photo shoots were in her home. And, you know, when you're Elizabeth Taylor, the world accommodates you. So the house was convenient for her. So as much as possible, people did, people came to her. And, uh, and she was like a general, you know, and there was a military operation, but it was Elizabeth's way of doing things. It wasn't a standard way. So for her, there was absolutely order in the chaos. And frankly, I don't know, I think she found it a little bit fun for so much chaos to be happening. And She focused on what she needed to focus on. She said what she wanted, and whatever she said was absolutely how it was done, uh, both in the house and in the world. And 
It was a lot. It was a lot. I mean, I miss those days, no question about it. And it was exciting. It was glamorous, but it was dramatic. And there was a lot of, you know, there was tragedy. She had health problems. Uh, but it's really where she set herself up to go out into the world and be Elizabeth Taylor. And before there was Tim Mendelson, there was Roger Wall, Elizabeth's longtime executive secretary, who was at her side to help her run her world from the inside out. Because I didn't understand the world of Elizabeth Taylor and how important that world is and how specific that world is. And, you know, there's certain things you don't make jokes about. Not in my position as a new person walking in. And I was 24 at that point. And they needed somebody to hang pictures on the wall. Like, that was my first job. So it was the office had a flood, and there were, you know, hundreds of pictures that all needed to be hung on the wall. I knew how to do that. I was good at that. And, uh, but there were a couple things that I didn't think should be hung. And one was a picture of a little girl. And I did not think it was a very pretty painting. And I said to Roger, I'm not hanging this. And... Then there was like five pictures in a row uh, of Elizabeth having plastic surgery. And I thought, I said, I'm not hanging this. And he said, just hang it. I did not understand that I couldn't talk that way at that time. And then I became that guy in a huge way. That policeman, that, you know, that, that, that security person, that you can't do this and you can't do that. But at that time, I didn't know. But it turns out the, the photos were from a film she made called Ash Wednesday. And in that film, she's older and has wrinkles, and she wants to get her husband back, who was played by Henry Fonda. And so she goes someplace and has all this surgery. So they're actually photos from the film, and it was all makeup. I didn't know that. Anyway, so maybe on my third day, I'd hung all the pictures, Roger took me into the trophy room which is just a small sitting room between the living room and the dining room. And there were cabinets, and there was all this silver and, and, you know, and china and crystal, and it was just not organized. So Roger said, put these things together in sets. All the pieces that don't go with anything or don't make sense, just pack them up, and I'm going to put them in storage because we need this to be more functional. Okay, so I'm sitting there, and I think probably early afternoon, I look up, and Elizabeth is standing there. She's in a red robe, a red Scazi robe, and she introduced herself, and she knew who I was because she knew I was in the house. She asked what I was doing, and before I could really say anything, Roger came running from the office and was like, he's just organizing the dishes. He's just putting some stuff in storage that doesn't match things. He's not doing anything wrong. <laughs> and, and Elizabeth said, wait a minute. She said, so you're telling me that he's here and he's organizing my china into sets. He's making sure the crystal is organized. He's making sure the silver is straight and protected. And Roger said, yeah. And she said, well, what's wrong with that? That's great. Thank you. So that was my first introduction to Elizabeth. While we can't all have the lavish lifestyle of a world-famous celebrity, we can treat ourselves to something nice during the holidays. Rakuten is here to help with that. Whether you're buying gifts for others or for yourself, you can get cash back at thousands of stores. We're here to help you save money, find the best deals, and get more bang for every buck. Head to Rakuten and get cash back at stores you love, like Macy's, Aveda, Lancome, Michael Kors, Ray-Ban, and more. With the cash back you earn, you can make your holiday season as lavish as Cleopatra. <laughs> well, almost. Wow your party guests with a perfectly decorated home. Put together a killer party outfit and makeup look. It's all possible with Rakuten. It's like getting paid to shop. 
Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Managing the order, storage, and security of Elizabeth's personal items would quickly grow more challenging. She liked to create the chaos, but she loved when things looked perfect. I mean, you know, she would go in the jewelry closet at night and pull all this, these pieces out and put combinations together and everything was everywhere. And, you know, with that much jewelry, with thousands of pieces of jewelry, I really had to keep them in their places because when she asked for something and she said, Tim, can you pick me out some, you know, some earrings and let's say whatever she was wearing, I was like, okay, so gold and pearl, or maybe she asked for gold and pearl. She had 30 pairs of gold and pearl earrings. And if I, there was one specific one I wanted to get, I, I, I had to get it immediately because she wasn't going to wait. I mean, I had an early experience. I was helping her pack and she was asking for things and she didn't expect to have to tell me where they were. But I didn't know where they were. I mean, with so many clothes and, and, and shoes and hand, I mean, there was so much of everything and I didn't know it then. So every time she'd ask me for something, I'd say, well, do you know where that is? And she didn't know where it was either. And so it became a very frustrating process. And eventually she went to her room and I went downstairs and then she called me back upstairs. And I remember specifically, she asked me for a red belt and I said, because we'd already had this thing, I said, and do you by any chance know where that is? And she said, let's not start this again. And I realized, oh, I can't ask her that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, you're in somebody's closet. You think you can ask them where things are, but I, I learned that very early on. I also learned that when she asked for something, you needed to do it right away. Because I, up until this point, she was always really sweet with me. and called me in my room and she asked for a lash, an eyelash conditioner. And I said, oh, okay, sure. I thought when we get home, I'll get that. I mean, she had some and it was just a lash conditioner. Okay. She called me like, I don't know, not, not, I mean, it was a while later and she asked for it and I didn't get it. And I didn't even realize I was supposed to get it then and there. She laid into me I was a nervous wreck for the next 18 years when she asked me for something. It was like training a dog. And that verbal slap, which was so hard over lash conditioner, she was training me. Every time she asked me for something, I was like, I would freeze. And she said at some point, stop doing that. And by the end of the trip, because there, there was a lot of stuff and I didn't know where everything, I mean, you know, it, it, we're not talking about, you know, a couple of outfits and three pairs of shoes. I mean, it, it's racks and racks of clothes and shoes across the room and handbags and jewelry and, and makeup and so many things. And I just, every time I, I, when she asked me for something, I instantly went into a freeze and then I would take a breath and say, oh yeah, it's right here. But by the end of that trip or sometime in the middle, she said, she said, stop doing that. But I couldn't help it. And then at the end of the trip, she said, I did a great job. And, you know, and she was really happy, but that was my nervous system changing. And it took a few years after she passed for that nervous system to calm down a little bit. But I'm still, I will always be tied to her. Tim would eventually replace Roger, taking on the responsibility of helping run Elizabeth's household. Personally, Elizabeth had a great sense of humor about herself. She did not take herself seriously, but what she did take extremely seriously was the commodity of Elizabeth Taylor, how things were put out into the world, which images were being used, what they looked like, how her name was being used, where the placement of her name was. And that she knew by the time I came to work for her, she knew it cold and she demanded that things be a certain way because she was protecting the commodity of Elizabeth Taylor, which was the thing that had value. 
to her, with her motto of thine own self be true, she was true to herself. She was true to her beliefs, her connection with a higher power, and her relationship with people that, were, that she was directly responsible to. Those are the things she took seriously as in her personal life, but generally she was, could make fun of herself and laugh at jokes about her and things like that. But the commodity was different. The commodity was the business, and her home was where that business was run from. Because she's the head, she's Elizabeth Taylor, and the business was Elizabeth Taylor. So in addition to family and friends and uh, you know, all the fun that happened at the house, business meetings, photo shoots, interviews, those were all taking place in her home. And that home was called House of Taylor because at one point, Elizabeth Arden owned the license for Elizabeth's fragrances. And on the packaging, it said, you know, Elizabeth Taylor White Diamonds. But on the back of the box, it said Elizabeth Arden. And that didn't make sense to Elizabeth. She was designing the fragrances. She was designing them the way she wanted them to be for herself and for her customer. And to have another woman's name on her packaging didn't make sense. So she asked the fragrance company to change that. And they said, well, what would you want it to say? And she said, well, I wanted to say House of Taylor. And they said, but that doesn't make sense. And she said, of course it makes sense. There's House of Dior, there's House of Chanel. They said, but those are actual houses. And she said, but this is the house of Taylor. This is where everything is run from. It's the exact same thing. And they changed it. Blending one's personal home with a workplace is something so many of us have now been trying to attempt. But Elizabeth's home office was next level. It was extra. As the founder and CEO of House of Taylor, the workforce around Elizabeth was professional and equivalent to an operation that would have happened in an office. And as with those workplaces, there are employees that stick and those that are better suited in another role or another company. So when it came to the professional people in her life, something wasn't working. Publicity, lawyer, attorney, uh, business manager, agent, manager, all of those roles, when she felt it was time for a change, she had no problem changing those people. That came from her. That was her decision. I was the queen of firing people at her house for a while. Every time I went up to her house, everybody knew someone was going to get axed. I mean, I'm a type of person who doesn't even want to return a pair of pants with the receipt. And suddenly I am <laughs> firing people. And you feel terrible, even though the, you know, they deserve to be fired. Or, but I would do it. There were times that I had to have security with me. There were times that I didn't. I had confidentiality agreements in hand all the time. I mean, I even stalked some guy in the supermarket one day because I needed him to sign paperwork. And we met in the frozen food section at Pavilions on <laughs> Santa Monica Boulevard. I mean, I would do whatever I needed to do. It didn't matter where, but I would do it. She wasn't that demanding, I have to be honest with you. The people around her were a pain in the ass, but she wasn't. It's usually the team that is painful, but the celebrity isn't. Um, they're just more difficult. Uh, she really wasn't. When it came to all the people working at the home, the stakes weren't as high. People had to really, really mess up for her to agree to let somebody go. But the micromanaging of every detail, she wasn't like that. She, she let a lot of stuff go for a long time. At some point, it was necessary to make changes, but that was not the place that Elizabeth didn't like to change people. Once she was happy with them, had love for them, knew that they loved her, she would let them get away with a lot until it finally came to a point where they really crossed a line. However large the business end of being Elizabeth Taylor would become while Elizabeth was alive, it was still all happening from a home, Elizabeth's home, 
where her family and friends would gather, where her personal, intimate life unfolded. Someone once said, there's no greater window into a woman's soul than her home. Every single frame, every, like, it was all there. It was forever there. Um, Nothing moved. So everything took on personality, too. Everything she had took on a personality. She was very sentimental. Like, a lot of, she knew everything that was there. You know, it was the plates and cups from Stad or, um, yeah, she, she, I mean, everything that she had around her had meaning. She was also such an exuberant, she was such a big presence, actively um, creating life and instigating it. Um, and she was always instigating it, always. Um, so I think that that's super important. Everything that was Elizabeth Taylor was run by Elizabeth out of her home, which meant everyone who worked for Elizabeth needed to be trusted and treated as family yet somehow still within professional boundaries. It was a delicate balance in which Elizabeth excelled as a boss. These two back-to-back accounts from Barbara and Tim illustrate Elizabeth's intentionality in achieving that balance. I was compartmentalized, I believe. Um, I didn't have a lot of interaction with her family too much, but For what I did for her, she didn't want me socializing too much with her her team because, frankly, I could be firing them the next day. So she liked to keep you off kilter. So she would be talking to me about something but wouldn't be telling the rest of her team that she had been meeting with me about certain things. She liked that. She didn't want the left hand knowing what the right hand was doing. There is an intentionality of keeping things separate. I would go to her house when I was looking to to move from my old firm. I was meeting with her at her house when she really didn't have very much of an office staff there on Saturdays. And I would come over and we would go through things. We would go go through things that were business. I would sit up there and cry that my cat had died. I remember that. I sat there and cried that I was never going to get a diamond ring. But she would, I think that she would have me come over when no one saw me. Again, she didn't want the right hand knowing what the left hand was doing. This is Christmas. It was a lot of work. And it was really tiring. But I was shopping on Rodeo Drive all day long. And I have to admit that as a little boy, I used to sort of dream about Rodeo Drive. Like it was just such an amazing place. My parents, we grew up in the valley, but you know, we went to see the Christmas decorations um, some of the years. And it was just like, for me, it was magical. But you can quickly become jaded. So I'm going to the street, whatever, going to the different stores, picking stuff up, picking things out, bringing it back to the house, going back and forth. And I was tired, and I was in Cartier, and I was there since the time it was light out and turned dark. So I I walked out of Cartier, it's nighttime, all the lights are twinkling on Rodeo Drive and beautiful decorations and Christmas music, and I just thought, this is so wonderful. How can I be tired? How can I be jaded? So... I picked up the frames from Cartier, and actually Elizabeth had these special frames that they made for her that were, you know, that were big, 8x10 style, and they had a heart cut out. And they would engrave with her handwriting. And so I picked those up, and I went to David Orgel, and those weren't ready yet. They weren't wrapped. So I gave them in the Cartier bag. I said, do you mind just leaving this in the back? And so I can go to another store and not have to carry it. Well, when I came back, they told me they had given it to somebody else. They messed up and I freaked out. And so I thought, well, I'm going to get fired, but I got to tell Roger. So I called up to the house and I told Roger he was in a complete panic. And after about 45 minutes, they received a phone call at the house 
saying that somebody had accidentally picked up, they saw it was Elizabeth Taylor, her packages, and he brought them back. So it all worked out. That night at dinner, we had dinner in the kitchen and Elizabeth joined us. You know, it was a casual house and, you know, it was a wooden table in the kitchen. And she sat at the head of the table and she said, we have kind of a magical Christmas story. You know, uh, 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 you know, a wonderful Christmas story. Something happened to Tim today. And so she told the story and how this person brought the, the, the frames back. And she made a really big deal about it. And I realize now looking back how she had already accepted me and was including me and was in her way introducing me. And that story, I'm, of course, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm so moved by that because, you know, I went on and everything was what it was, crazy, bigger than life. But I, 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 at looking back to try to understand how quickly we connected and what Elizabeth did, you know, in those first times when we were together to make me feel comfortable. Elizabeth's home operation was challenging and warm and emotionally comfortable and highly functional. It was also an extremely rare environment under any circumstances. She didn't necessarily want things to be in museums, but she really didn't want things to be in bank vaults. And she didn't keep her jewelry in the bank vault. In my 20 years with her, it was all at the house. I certainly wouldn't have said that when she was alive, but now it's fair to say that she wanted access to her jewelry and she wanted to be able to, you know, use it and wear it and show it off and enjoy it. She didn't want it to be locked away in some bank vault, which is interesting because there's a line in Butterfield 8. She said, I've had more fun in the back of a 54 Chevy than I could ever have at the vault at the Chase National Bank. And that was Elizabeth. No one had a home quite like Elizabeth Taylor. It was the center of her universe. Her business and what would become known as her brand were run by Elizabeth out of her home. Her safe space was upstairs in her bedroom, where she often conducted her most important meetings. This is where she could both restore and create so that she had the personal reserve she needed to scoop you up and place you in her nest. Her team, like her security team, was always very, very on top of things, a little neurotically sometimes, but they had to keep her safe. This is a woman who... Shockingly, so if you want to say, what do we make? 175 million between her art and her jewelry that was kept in her house without a gun on the property. No guns. She didn't want anybody to have guns. They had to beg us to let them have a taser. So she had the jewelry closet that was filled to the brim with all of her jewelry. She never wanted things to be in, locked up in a safety deposit box because she needed access. So she had some safes and she had an alarm jewelry closet. And then she had all this art. Now I'm an art idiot, okay? I couldn't tell you the artists and their import of things, but I had a friend come up to her house one day and he turned green. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? He says, I'm an art history major. Do you not see what's in front of you? I said, yeah, whatever. He goes, no, no, no. There are more masters, you know, from the Monet's to the Franz Halls to the Picasso. Everything just casually, like posters on a wall. And there were more on her wall than a lot of museums have in their entire place. She liked beautiful things. As a boss, as a mother, as an artist, as a humanitarian, in every role, Elizabeth Taylor was all woman, self-made. Her granddaughter, former fashion stylist and gallerist, Naomi Wilding, brings us a taste of this aspect of Elizabeth from inside the home. The first closet was the bomb shelter in Switzerland. And I don't remember this that well because I was quite little... Um, but the bomb shelter in Switzerland was converted to a closet. And so when we were little, 
And like my mom and dad, we'd all meet up in Switzerland for Christmas and things and everybody would raid the bomb shelter and then they'd go out. You know, it's like this little town in Switzerland, but you know, like the Taylor family would go out dressed up in like wild clothes. Um, and then I spent a fair bit of time at grandma's house when my dad had just moved kind of permanently to the States. My mom was still in the UK and um, my my bedroom at the time was up on the same floor with, with my grandmother, but which was great. But then the next time I went, that had been converted into a closet. <laughs> like everything just ended up becoming a receptacle for her clothes eventually. It's like she just kept running out of space. But no, I used to just, I used to just, go in there, <laughs> just be with it, you know, try things on, touch things, you know, they were arranged by color or texture, it seemed like just so beautiful. I mean, really like the most sumptuous textures and colors. And, and then when I went to fashion college, I, I'd spend the summers and stay at grandma's house and and do like photo shoots with her clothes. She was very generous. She gave lots of things, you know, if, if you liked something, she'd very often give it to you, especially because I was smaller then and she was getting older. So there's some of her older things that didn't fit her anymore. She's like, well, you should have that. Or, you know, she she dressed us up to go out. She loved it. She was very involved. I think that so much of her power, her power came out of her femininity. About It came from the fact that she was a woman. And I think... Um, that that was always the case for her. She was such a, a, a female force for good. You know, the, the kind that I think that those of us who consider ourselves to be feminists, or even if you think historically about so many female leaders going back thousands of years, she really embodied that female power of goodness that like we said before really it came from her heart and her compassion but instead of using that in sort of perhaps what we would consider sort of traditionally feminine ways she used it to be empowered and I think that people connected to her as a woman in a way that they would not have heard a man say the same things and connect in the same way I that's how I feel anyway yeah, I, I mean, everything was as a woman. She, there was nothing masculine about Elizabeth, but she was tough and she was powerful. But she didn't turn herself into something that she wasn't. And she was ultimately female in every way. And in the span of an hour, you know, she would be a matriarch at something, you know, depending on what was happening, you know. There were times when she was a little girl. I mean, playing with jewelry and playing with makeup and things like that, she was more a little girl-like, but then also the businesswoman. She's very tough as a businesswoman and very serious and very protective of the commodity of Elizabeth Taylor. She really, really protected it. And she knew its value. And, uh, but, and she, she could be sexy, you know? I mean, she was ultimately a pretty sensual, sexual being. I mean, I think that's not a surprise. Elizabeth was every stage of woman. And like I said, in the span of an hour, it could be that way. So it's really fascinating. She was endlessly entertaining for me. In some ways, I was her partner. So, you know, she, I think she expected that. And, you know, I was very argumentative to the point of being a total pain in the ass. I mean, she must have loved me to put up with some of my stuff. You know, yes, it was a job and certainly it was a friendship and it went beyond, you know, any kind of traditional boss employee um, relationship. But, it, you know, we had a relationship and a lot of very personal things happened to her, to me, that we were there for each other. Um, you know, that's a lot of years. So we were totally there for each other. It's just that I just really want people to understand how ultimately female she was and and powerful and there was no question i realized that i didn't know her earlier in her life but while i worked for her there, there was just nothing about her that didn't feel empowered it just wasn't a question i didn't see it anyway if she ever felt that way you didn't it wasn't visible
I mean, it was just, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm demanding. And she was Elizabeth Taylor, you know, but that still was her. I mean, she, she was Elizabeth Taylor because of who she was. You know, the bigness of that, the power in that, you know, the value monetarily. Regardless of how successful we might be, doing as Elizabeth did, getting our outsides to match our insides, to snap ourselves together, tragedy still can come. No one, not even Elizabeth, could control that. On August 5th, 1984, Richard Burton tragically passed away. When Richard died, a month later, something, she wanted to go to the cemetery. And then she and Liza came and stayed with me. Nobody knew she was coming. And Eliza had this wonderful, Liza had a wonderful idea, let's take umbrellas. I said, what the hell for your umbrella? The sun will shine. No, but in case there's a photographer, you open the umbrella and then he can't get to you. Would you believe it that we arrived at the cemetery, the three of us, me driving my car, and we arrived near the grave, and the shit photographer, they popped up. They must have been sitting there for weeks knowing that one day she would show up. It was awful. It was really terrible. So we stayed two minutes and then we left. That I remember very well. It was not nice. But then I went with her. There was a, a service in London. I went there with her. There was a service for Richard. She was very sad when he passed away. Poor Richard. He was young when he died. He was very young. Not a very healthy life. The last time I saw him, which was two months before his death, uh, he was so proud of what I'd done. And he was very interested, very inquisitive about what had gone on at the Betty Ford Center and how I'd done it and what the process, the procedure was. I think he would have eventually gone. Losing the ones we love to a tragic disease is a specific kind of pain, a helpless pain. Where that disease might have a treatment or cure or prevention to alleviate the suffering, but the resources and care can't reach the patient. Well, that's a helplessness that induces rage, righteous rage. AIDS is fear, devastating fear, fear of death. Fear of suffering. Fear of the pain that will be experienced by loved ones left behind. Fear of being found out. And fear of bearing the brunt of the senseless stigma of AIDS. Discrimination. And blame. Fear that destroys reason. Fear that destroys close personal relationships at a time when relationships are most needed. AIDS is irrational. Fear of contagion to many of those who are not infected. Unwanted fear of personal association and fear of what is perceived to be the unknown. If we can do something, if help is possible, and we choose failure, apathy, or silence instead, well, that's an unthinkable choice for anyone with a heart with empathy. Imagine you were told you had AIDS. Yes, AIDS and the fear of it indeed are terrifying. Fear that threatens to tear apart the very fabric of our society. There's that oft-quoted line, with great power comes great responsibility. Sometimes the responsibility shows up first. And we have to figure out what kind of power we have to take it on. Power we can draw on from our relationships, from the unique history in our individual journeys, from within ourselves, in the reserves of strength earned from every battle waged, like overcoming loss and facing down addiction. To do this, we can do what Elizabeth did, find a mirror, look deep into our lives, assess all that we have available, and then roar. We are truly face to face with an urgent crisis 
which indeed tests our ability to call ourselves civilized. We are at war with AIDS. On the next episode of Elizabeth the First. It's mysterious, it's deadly, and it's baffling medical science. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. People in people in the hospital, people with AIDS. The mailman, some mailmen wouldn't deliver their mail. The in the hospital, the uh, attendants wouldn't bring food into their room. Families kicked them out all the time. And that really angered me. I thought, what is the matter with this country? What is the matter with this world? It's happening right under our noses. Then I thought, wait a minute. It's happening right under my nose. Why am I not doing anything? And so she went to work. She said she got hang-ups. She said she got death threats. Some major, major people had, they were not willing to help. And she was appalled that the entertainment community, you know, which was her community, of all people, would not have sensitivity to gay men dying of AIDS. She was just, it was like, wow, she knew what she was doing. She was bossing all of these thousands of people. And she's just like, you know, be quiet. I'm talking. I have something really important to say. Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. Joshua Klebe wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese Tivy. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit ElizabethTaylorAIDSFoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon by number one New York Times bestselling author Kate Anderson Brower will be out on December 6. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.